Patricia Rucker, welcome to the Civic Leader Podcast. I'm so glad that you're here today. Um, I want to introduce you. Uh, Patricia is a first-generation American citizen, born in Caracas, Venezuela. Uh, you came to the U.S. to Montgomery County, Maryland in the 80s when your father was assigned by the Agence Française Presse to the uh, Washington desk, and he later became the editor for uh, Latin American News. Um, you went to Montgomery County, Maryland Public Schools, and you earned a degree in tr at Trinity College in Washington, D.C., with a BA in history and a minor in Latin American studies. And you were a teacher in Montgomery County Public Schools and you're a mother of five. You're a co-founder and former president of We the People of West Virginia, Jefferson County. And you got involved in grassroots politics in your county and became, today you are the West Virginia State Senator serving in the 16th district. An incredible story. And on top of that, I read that you had fascinating hobbies of gardening, beekeeping, <laughs> raising chicken, and, and you have a small hobby farm. So thank you so much for um, be coming uh, today. Um, I want to say, you know, I invited you to uh, read with me this brief on Venezuela because throughout your life, you went back to Venezuela and you saw the transformation when Hugo Chavez took power and you heard the language, the promises of Chavez. And, and this is why I invited you uh, to read and discuss this policy brief on socialism in Venezuela. So Patricia, welcome to the Civic Leader Podcast. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be a uh, part of it. And I'm really excited about you having this topic, which is very dear to my heart. Well, I want to say to our audience here that the goal of the podcast is twofold. One is to interview civic leaders who make a difference in their communities. And the other is really to provide an audio version of the Policy Circle briefs that are available at thepolicycircle.org. And I invite everyone to visit thepolicycircle.org and start a circle, be a convener, and facilitate informed discussions on complex issues using a brief. And Venezuela, what's happened there uh, is, is a complex issue and also is very dear to my heart because um, my daughter is 18 year old. She was born in 2002. And that was two years after uh, Hugo Chavez became president. And I think Patricia, you, you've been going back and forth and uh, you've seen what Venezuela was when uh, you were very young and you've seen the transformation uh, of Venezuela in a very short period of time, right? Yes, I have. And I did go to Venezuela every other summer, all the years I was growing up. Um, so even after we moved to the United States, absolutely was still spending two months every other year in Venezuela with relatives, traveling, and, and definitely got to see what it was like. But unfortunately, the last time I was in Venezuela was in 2001. and um, I was pregnant with my third child. I can tell you that uh, it's kind of emotional to say this, but in that one year that President Chavez had been president, already there was a marked difference. When I went, I had gone in 1999 and I went in 2001. And when I went in 2001, it was the first time ever in my entire life I was scared to walk down the street. I was nervous about being by myself on the suburbs of Caracas, um, where my grandmother and grandfather lived. And uh, it was really sad. But uh, we never went back because things became too dangerous after that. Yeah, I remember at the time I was uh, working with a small um, travel company who was organizing eco tours in Venezuela, Angel Falls. And, uh, and they were, we were building the website and getting people to, to go to Venezuela. And, and that's when they had to just stop. It just became so uh, dangerous. I and mean, we're no longer a safe uh, tourist destination. And uh, it was just really sad. So what we are going to do is we will be reading the brief and we will alternate between uh, Patricia and I. And in between, we will also have a discussion 
around uh, the, the sections of the brief that, that we read. Um, so I'll start with the introduction and, and why, we, um, why we chose this as a topic. You know, in the 50s, Venezuela was the fourth wealthiest country in the world. And today, Venezuela is poorer than it was prior to the 20s. Its infrastructure is deteriorating and its economy has been shrinking since the turn of the century. Hyperinflation, that's out of control price increases, has left the currency worthless and made it almost impossible for Venezuelans to afford basic necessities. Millions have fled the country in hospitable conditions. And the question is, how did the country go from having a GDP on par with that of the United States, the New, New Zealand, Switzerland, to having almost 90% of the population living in poverty? And that is in the lifespan of our children, that is in 18 years, in 18 years. Um, you know, I think it's just, it's just incredible. And uh, on, in the brief, you'll find other interviews. We have the interview here with Patricia. Uh, we've interviewed other people from Venezuela. We talked about their experience. So I invite you to listen to those um, in, the, in the brief available in the policy circle that might be available. Um, so Patricia, I'll turn it over to you to share some of the stories of what it, what life is like in uh, Venezuela, and we briefly call them case studies. So the Venezuelan people were supposed to be enjoying all the benefits of naturalization and government-run social programs. Instead, they are fleeing the country. For those who stay, life on the ground in what was once Latin America's richest nation is now beyond comprehension. Um, Example, a dozen eggs is the equivalent of three days of wages for Marilyn Alma, a mother of three who had to give up custody of her eldest child because she could not feed him. Laura crosses the Simon Bolivar International Bridge into Colombia to cut and sell her hair for 30,000 pesos, the equivalent of about $10. She spends 8,000 of those pesos on insulin her daughter needs to manage her diabetes insulin that is no longer available in Venezuela. One employee from the airport in Maracaibo claimed his employer demanded the staff present a photo of their ballots as proof they voted for Maduro and his candidates during the 2018 elections. Giuseppe Cordivani's factory on the outskirts of Caracas used to make 300 pairs of shoes every day, but now only makes 20. State price controls and hyperinflation have made it impossible to stock materials or pay employees. Omar Cedeno, a butcher, was arrested for selling his goods at prices higher than the regulated price, which is necessary to keep his shop running. American freelance journalist Cody Weddle, who had been living in Caracas for four years, was taken into custody after an early morning raid on his home by military counterintelligence forces. He was released later that evening and deported. Marcos Carvajal, the former MLB pitcher for the Colorado Rockies and Florida Marlins, died of pneumonia in Venezuela in February 2018. Necessary antibiotics were hard to find and did not arrive from abroad in time to treat Carvajal. It's heartbreaking. I can give you more stories from my personal family's um, experience. My grandmother died of a very preventable issue because we could not raise the funds quickly enough to bribe the doctors and nurses in the hospital to treat it. We, they, they demanded a certain amount of money. They contacted us here and we tried, you know, we had to move funds around and to get it down there by the time we did, she had died. It was, I mean, that's just crazy. And I have a cousin who is a doctor and he had, he, before Chavez, he was a doctor and a professor in the University of Caracas. So he working, you know, his own clinic and uh, teaching others. After Chavez's price controls occurred, he had to quit and worked as a taxi driver because Chavez said that doctors were making too much money and were being greedy. And he decided they could no longer demand money from patients who didn't have it. So he could make more money to support his family as a taxi driver than he could as a doctor. 
And to this day, they still, they're still still in Venezuela, but they have moved to the very outskirts near Colombia so that they can go into Colombia when they need something. Yeah, no, it's, it's incredible. We have a friend who's now like sending boxes of basic food, basic necessities um, to, to his mother. And um, it, it's just tragic how, how it happened. So we'll walk through, you know, why it matters and also kind of putting it in context, a little bit of the historical uh, perspective and the, and the economic uh, decisions that were made by uh, Chavez government. So I'll read a section on why it matters. You know, what separates Venezuela from similar nation is its history of centralizing power, its government overreach, and its inability to stabilize external and fiscal accounts. By imposing price controls, expropriating private property, and conducting large-scale industry nationalization, the Venezuelan government wrecked the economy and eliminated economic freedom of its citizen. The dismantling of democracy checks and balances and sheer incompetence led Venezuela to collapse. The media have assigned blame for Venezuela humanitarian crisis on causes such as falling oil prices. However, you know, Saudi Arabia, Nigeria, Kuwait are all petrostates that saw their income fall when oil prices dropped, but emerged from recession with their economy intact. Uh, additionally, although President Maduro has blamed the U.S. and its imposed sanctions, none of these sanctions were broad enough to inflict the type of damage Venezuela is currently suffering. The regimes of Presidents Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro, Maduro decimated the country through relentless class welfare and government intervention in the economy. Maintaining basic freedoms and remaining committed to the rule of law, limited government and checks and balances is what separates true democratic nations from Venezuela and what the rest of the world must remember to adhere to. Um, maybe you, you can, can you tell us a little bit of the, of this, the, the mindset of Hugo Chavez and the language that he was using to lure, he was elected, he, he had one run for office where he did not win, and then he was elected, right, making promises uh, to the electorate. Can you tell us a little bit about what he was saying? saying yes, I, I was fortunate or unfortunate enough to have been in Venezuela while uh, Chavez was campaigning. And he, um, I'll never forget, two, three hour long speeches and essentially would make all sorts of promises. Um, he was going to end corruption forever. He was going to make certain that the rich got what they deserved, that they have been stepping on the backs of the poor for too long. And he was going to, you know, take it from them and give it to the poor and all the poor would have good homes and enough food and uh, the government would take care of them. Um, it was in short, a uh, very uh, rosy picture of you will never have to worry about anything ever again because the government is going to handle it for you. Um, those were, you know, just a summary of the hours, promises. And hours and hours of speaking and promises and, and painting this picture. Um, and it was crazy to me when I was there because nobody in Venezuela was suffering that much. Yes, there was poverty. There's no question. My own family definitely was in the lower class in Venezuela. But you had enough food to eat. You had a roof over your head. You had water and electricity, and we had the lowest, you know, gasoline prices in the world. Um, you could go to the local pharmacy and get any drug you needed. Um, the hospitals have always been, you know, what, what you could afford. But I, there's always been Catholic hospitals that treated the poor, no matter what. It was really strange the way Chavez would like be making these promises, and I would be listening with my own relatives, and I'd be saying, but we don't really have, like, we don't have that problem right now. We're not starving. We're, we, we have food. Um, but that, that's the sense of what he would say to get elected. Well, let's put it in context and, and kind of walk back a little bit in the history of Venezuela. And uh, the, uh, the first part is really the oil boom from the 40s to the 70s. So, Patricia, do you want to cover that? Um, sure. I'll be happy to, yes. Um, geologists from the Royal Dutch Shell 
struck oil in the Northeast region of Venezuela in 1922. Annual production during the 1920s increased from about 1 million barrels to 137 million, putting Venezuela second only to the U.S. in total oil output. By the mid-1930s, oil totaled 90% of exports and was pushing out all other economic sectors. However, foreign companies, including Royal Dutch Shell, controlled 98% of Venezuelan oil. In response, the Venezuelan government enacted a law in 1943 that required foreign companies to give half of their oil profits to the state. Within five years, the government's income had increased sixfold. Venezuela's prominence in the oil market and government oversight of the industry was a constant throughout the 1940s and 1950s. In 1960, Venezuela became a founding member of the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, otherwise known as OPEC, through which the world's largest oil producers coordinate prices to give states more control. Joining OPEC substantially benefited Venezuela during the 1970s, when an OPEC embargo during the Yom Kippur War caused oil prices to soar. Venezuela's per capita income quickly became the highest of any country in Latin America as oil revenues quadrupled in 1976. President Perez created the state-run oil company, Petróleos de Venezuela, to, uh, the abbreviations are PDVSA, to supervise the oil industry. So the oil boss, so in between 1980s and the 2000s, in the 80s, global oil prices plummeted due to crude oil surpluses after the 1970s energy crisis. As Venezuela was almost entirely reliant on oil, the price crash brought Venezuela's economy down with it. In 1989, President Paris implemented an austerity package as part of an international monetary fund bailout. Riots and strikes ensued, followed by an attempted coup by Hugo Chavez in the early 90s. Although unsuccessful in his initial overthrow attempt, Chavez rose to fame and was elected president in 98. And once in power, Chavez raised oil income taxes on foreign companies in Venezuela. He promised to use the revenues to expand government-run welfare programs, hire more government workers, raise the minimum wage, and redistribute land. Meanwhile, the state-run oil industry faltered due to the control structure of the government. After a strike in 2002-2003, Chavez fired thousands of PDVSA workers, replace them with loyal supporters with little technical or managerial expertise, and foreign investor and oil firms disliked the government interference, lost faith in PDVSA, and stopped operations. So do you want to read about the collapse here, starting in 2000? Absolutely. In an attempt to gain more control over the economy, President Chavez went on a nationalist spree in the 2000s that pushed out all private enterprise, starved industries of technical expertise and investment, and sent government-controlled institutions into a downward spot. Exchange rates controls and price controls broke the basic link between supply and demand, oh, creating right. surreal economic distortions. Um, for more information on supply and demand markets and price controls, there's a policy brief um, called Free Enterprise Brief. This suffocated private enterprise. Price controls prevented private businesses from setting their own prices, making it nearly impossible to make a profit. Both foreign and domestically owned companies stopped investing in Venezuela, and new businesses did not replace them due to red tape, corruption, and fear. Their private property was not secure. In 2011, Latin America received over $150 billion in foreign investment. Venezuela only accounted for $5 billion of this amount, while neighboring Brazil received $67 billion. Chavez garnered strong relationship with countries such as, such as China, Russia, and Cuba to endure the inevitable disasters of his policies. He frequently announced new government programs to deliver free or heavily discounted goods that resulted from these relationships, such as refrigerators and cars, to the poorest in the nation. These efforts kept the worst case scenario of Venezuela's impending crisis at bay and also continuously won Chavez 
popular sentiment around election times. This stopped when Chavez died, reportedly of cancer in 2013. Chavez's vice president, Nicolas Maduro, assumed the presidency in 2014, but this did not change the economy's trajectory. Oil prices tumbled, inflation reached over 50%, prompting Maduro to cut public spending. By mid-2016, hundreds of thousands of Venezuelans were protesting. Maduro's response was to crack down on dissent. For more on Venezuelan history, Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro, you can watch The Collapse of Venezuela. This is a Fox video. So the rule of government, um, Venezuela's situation was the product of years of government policies and economic mismanagement. The clear signs of trouble came from a charismatic leader who promised the nation that government was a solution to their woes and made the country dependent on one resource while shutting down competition, diversity of opinion, and debate. It might seem strange that such a chain of events could happen without notice, but the slow dissolution of democracy often happens while many blindly laud the intermediary steps. So first there was the Bo Bolivarian Revolution. So Chavez identified with the Venezuelans who suffered under the IMF-backed austerity measures during the late 80s and mid 90s. And his campaign promise was to use his power to distribute public and private oil revenues to the poor. Chavez spent these funds on social services and welfare programs. The social programs called Misiones delivered basic services for education, health, employment, there was practically no limit to these welfare programs. One year, the government handout approximately included approximately 200,000 homes. This Bolivarian revolution initially improved a number of social indicators, such as literacy, income per capita, unemployment rates, and infant mortality. Between 1999 literacy um, and 2011, Venezuela Gini coefficient, a measure of income and quality, fell from 0.5 to 0.39, meaning Venezuela had fairer income distribution in all of Latin America and ranked just ahead of the US and only behind Canada and Western Hemisphere. But between and between 2003 and 2013, poverty levels fell from 61% of the population to 34%. So I'd love for you, Patricia, to comment on that uh, in terms of those, those, met, you know, those measures um, and what it meant really uh, on the ground during that time. So I have to tell you that as always, when government has well-meaning intentions to give things away to folks, those giveaways were not equally distributed to anyone and everyone. It went to a large extent to those who backed Chavez. Um, if you made the mistake of ever showing up at any protest or having the, you know, the wrong political party affiliation, you got nothing. You were blacklisted. And at the same time that they was giving some of these things to the poor and certain people, Chavez was also closing um, the schools that had been run by the Catholic Church and which educated the poor um, without money to, you know, who did not have money to pay, essentially taking away means to educate the poor class so that they would be able to rise to the middle class. So he was giving things away, um, but not uh, investing in long-term um, mm -hmm. growth. Yeah, and it was just to his supporters. So it was not, so it was not. Yeah. So talk about, read about the nationalization here, about the, what that means, what that meant in Venezuela. Chavez's economic model intended to have community enterprises working alongside the private sector. But government overreach meant national agencies, co-ops, and state industries comprised the bulk of the economy. Starting in 2007, the government used oil revenue to buy the largest electricity and telecommunication companies. It also seized the largest agricultural supply companies, the largest steel producer, glass producer, and the three largest cement industries. These produce little return, and co-ops in particular often wound up in the hands of incompetent and corrupt political cronies. 
Additionally, private enterprises suffered a number of state-imposed regulations and high taxes. International airlines stopped servicing flights to Venezuela, and businesses, including General Motors, Clorox, and Kellogg's, at risk of having their assets taken by the state, fled the inhospitable economic conditions. For 2019, Venezuela is ranked as one of the worst countries in which to do business. And one of the businesses that ended up being chased out of Venezuela was Polar. Polar beer and Polar also created Arena Pan, which is how Venezuelans make their staple, which is arepas, um, ended up moving out of Venezuela. And now this Venezuelan-owned company that created the staple food and beer um, Venezuelans can no longer afford. Yeah, and I'm sure there's no like small businesses that are opening, right? There's no, there's no like small businesses or innovation that can flourish in, in Venezuela because of the corruption, because of the red tape, and because of the, all the price controls. People are just not able to not able to employ people to to start to offer a service. Uh, that's part of the economy. They may do it in the black market, but certainly not right. as a real company that could grow and hire people, right? There's no incentive. There's no incentive to actually make money because if you are successful, the government is going to take it from you. So that's that's what this regime does. You you. I had several small business owners in my family. And you know, if you're just scraping by, they leave you alone. But if you actually are successful and growing, then you're considered the enemy and they they say, well, you have too much money, so we're going to take it and we're redistributing, which basically means the government gets to do with it whatever they want. What's also interesting is how these companies that are nationalized become staffed, not with professionals, but with political allies and and friends, and they, become, they start to be completely mismanaged. And I think I read um, one company was the fertilizer uh, companies that became completely inefficient, unable to provide fertilizers to the agricultural um, farms of Venezuela, and therefore production completely went down. Venezuela used to be the breadbasket of South America, and now has to import flour, which and it all came from this chain effect of of real incompetence and not letting competent people run enterprise and, and flourish. And the farms were taken over by the state. They broke them up from being these big farms that were run by people who knew what they were doing. And he would give small sections out to the poor. Well, when you have this only a small parcel of land and you cannot produce efficiently enough, then they continue to be poor. They're never going to make enough to actually grow beyond just the basic poverty and definitely not enough to feed the population. Not even yeah, right. It becomes like subsidence agriculture, right? And it's not enough to feed the rest of the city. So, so we have a section here on the freedom of speech. Um, before, so we, there's a box here on, did you know, before Chavez land reforms, about 5% of Venezuela's population own 80% of private land. At the start of reform, the re government seized over 3 million acres and resettled more than 15,000 families. Very few have been compensated for the land seized. So that's what you, exactly what you were talking about. Those 15,000 people that own a parcel of land were certainly not able to produce enough to, to feed the country. Um, government oversight of the media and efforts to stop coverage of the opposition have escalated in recent years. The government has threatened news outlet that covered the opposition, shut down radio station, raided television channels, and blocked websites. A number of international journalists have been arrested and deported. Even veteran Univision News anchor uh, Jorge Ramos was detained during any, any interview with President Maduro. Freedom House, an international organization that analyzes challenges to freedom, ranked Venezuela as not free in its 2017 Freedom of Press report. Article 57 of Venezuela's 1999 constitution guarantees freedom of expression, and Article 51 guarantees the right to access public information. However, the 2005 Law on Social Responsibility in Radio, Television, and Electronic Media 
bans any content that could incite or promote hatred or disrespect authorities. As in other authoritarian countries in Venezuela, there is no protection for either citizens or the media to speak out against the government. Um, yeah, I can tell you that's definitely true. And um, people have disappeared, been put in jail, or have had to flee for their safety if they have um, spoken out against government. So do you want to read the section on suppression of opposition? Absolutely. Venezuelan security forces routinely use tear gas and rubber bullets to suppress protesters. In 2016, Maduro responded to massive demonstrations involving over 6 million Venezuelans by banning street protests, which led to over 130 deaths and almost 5,000 arrests. In 2017, United Nations human rights officials were not allowed into the country during an investigation of over 120 deaths that could have been related to government forces. Many protests have been in response to government attempts to consolidate power. In 2015, the government opposition gained a two-thirds majority in Venezuela's Congress, the National Assembly. President Maduro then stripped the Congress of its constitutional powers and replaced it with a constituent assembly packed with legislators loyal to Maduro's regime. Maduro also declared the assembly Supreme Court appointments illegal and replaced the Supreme Court with a parallel Supreme Tribunal of Justice, also packed with new magistrates that Maduro trusted. Um, so free and fair elections, and that's in, in brackets, suspicious activities surrounded the 2018 Venezuelan presidential election. In the month leading up to the election, Maduro blocked opposition parties from participating or campaigning and arrested opposition candidates. After voting, many people visited red spots, pro-government booths where they could receive government-subsidized food boxes and give their names to workers who were keeping lists of those who had voted. Although workers claimed there was no effort to link a pro-Maduro vote to future food deliveries, one woman said she felt compelled to vote for Mr. Maduro and feared she could lose her government job if she did not give her name at the red spot. The results revealed had received, that Maduro had received 5.8 million votes for comparison, he received 7.5 million votes in 2013 election after Chavez's death. His main rival, Henry Falcon, all who ran even though fellow opposition members called for an election boycott, received 1.8 million votes. Maduro claimed victory, but the organization Observación Ciudadana, Citizen Observation, and several international organizations announced the results listing cases of coercion, intimidation, and the fact that only 46% of Venezuelans voted on election day. For the three previous presidential election in 2006, 2012, 2013, between 70 to 80% of the population voted. And to understand how Venezuela's 2000 elections violated Venezuelan law and internationally recognized standards, there's, there's a whole infographic that explained that. Um, do you have some comments about the elections that happened in 2018 in Venezuela? So obviously, you know, I wasn't there and don't have firsthand knowledge, but I can tell you that many of my family stopped voting. And then there were many Venezuelans who have left Venezuela and um, are supposed, uh, they're still Venezuelan citizens and are supposed to be able to vote even from, you know, the countries they are at now. And were not given, the, the Venezuelan embassies did not um, accept their ballots, made excuses. So those um, Venezuelan citizens who have left out of necessity or need, were those votes definitely were not counted. And yes, I mean, clearly, just clearly, there was intimidation and there was fear. And remember, this is after years of the regime blacklisting you if you ever protested or spoke against, basically starving the citizens to death who are not in agreement. Um, I mean, he has cowed the population to, to such an extent that a lot of them have left if they could. So it's truly, I, I, I can tell you my relatives in Venezuela do not really believe that um, it's Venezuelans controlling the country. It is 
foreign nationals that are controlling the country. But we can talk about that later. Yeah, that's a whole other that's a whole other topic, right? The Cuban forces, military forces that are controlling the the country, and it's hard to see a political path, uh, a peaceful return to uh, a democracy right now uh, ah. in, in Venezuela. Um, so we have here in the brief several like current challenges around oil, oil production, inflation, education, healthcare, um, and and then also uh, a refugee crisis. So um, maybe let's um, let's uh, you know do we want to read through each of these sections? I guess we could. Um, let's read through the oil curse first. I can do the old curse. Yeah. How did the nation that is home to the world's largest oil reserves find itself in its current situation so different from that of Saudi Arabia with the second largest oil reserve? According to political scientist Michael Ross, part of Venezuela's crisis stems from becoming dependent on its most abundant resource, oil. Using oil revenues for social change continuously deepened the dependence on the resource. There was little concern when oil prices were high in the mid-2000s, but prices fell in 2014, and Venezuela no longer has the funds to import what it does not produce at home. For this reason, welfare programs have been cut back, including government handouts called CLAP boxes, C-L-A-P. In 2018, one researcher at the University of Venezuela claimed the boxes supplied about half of Venezuela's food requirements and noted that the boxes dropped from 16 kilograms in January to 11 kilograms in May. Chavez did little to improve how Venezuela actually makes money. He paid no attention to diversifying the economy and domestic production outside of the oil sector. Instead of relying on an entrepreneurial economy to produce a variety of goods and services to generate wealth, Chavez's policies made citizens dependent on one commodity. So production. So many Venezuelans were initially excited when Chavez rose to power, but not all has gone according to plan. The country's GDP, gross domestic product, suffered its third consecutive year of double-digit losses in 2018. And most recent estimate placed the GDP at $80 billion. Neighboring uh, Colombia's GDP is over $300 billion. And the U.S. is over $19 trillion. Billion. $19 trillion. So domestic production has plunged and food imports have soared to $7.5 billion, a six-fold increase since Chavez became president. According to the director of Venezuela's Confederation of Associations of Agricultural Producers, Venezuela has gone from producing 70% of its food to importing 70% of its food. All materials from seeds to fertilizer are provided by the government, but farmers report that they often do not receive supplies. Additionally, the government-controlled steel industry does not produce enough machinery and inflation has made it impossible to afford importing new equipment. So inflation, do you want to read the section about inflation, which is absolutely yes. crazy? All revenues allowed Venezuela to import goods from abroad. But when all revenues declined, Venezuela could no longer import the goods it did not produce itself. The scarcity of goods drove prices up, resulting in massive inflation. The price controls under President Chavez made necessities more affordable, but it was no longer profitable for businesses to make them. As a result, people were forced to turn to the government for handouts or to the black market. President Maduro repeatedly increased the minimum wage in an attempt to combat inflation. In August of 2018, a 3,000% increase equated to about $20 a month. This had almost no effect. Almost 90% of Venezuela's population lives in poverty, and prices were doubling on average every 19 days by the end of 2018. Inflation has already topped 1 million percent. No foreign investors are willing to risk a capital investment given the economic instability, and inflation will continue to rise as the government prints more money. Could easing government control of the economy help Venezuela? 
over the summer of 2019, the Maduro regime scaled back on price controls, printing money, minimum wage increases, and regulating importers and businesses. The opposition-controlled National Assembly says inflation has fallen from 2.6 million percent, 2.6 million percent, in January 2019 to 135,000 percent in August after these changes. The massive immigration of Venezuelans has also boosted the economy since those who fled sent rem remittances back home in the form of dollars, which are now accepted and used just as much as Bolivar is in regular transactions and on the black market. Despite the drop, inflation is still sky high. See the $15 cereal image here. You can go and see that. Most Venezuelans still depend on nearly worthless believers, and the national minimum wage still equates to less than $2 per month. The deputy chief economist for the Institute of International Finance in Washington warned that the measures undertaken in Venezuela are not part of a well-thought-out adjustment program and that stratospheric inflation could return if the regime abandons its improvised reforms. The IMS still expects the economy to contract by about 35% for 2019, marking 21 consecutive quarters of decline. So education is another challenge. As the economy crumbles, education has become a luxury. Many students go to school primarily to receive the state-sponsored meals, but many schools delayed the start of classes in September. In 2018, due to the lack of power, inadequate sanitation, and sufficient food. In September 2019, thousands of teachers did not show up to classes, opting for different jobs that earn slightly more money and trying their luck abroad. There's a, there's a video from the Washington Post that illustrates the enrollment and staffing troubles in the country. Post-secondary education is also suffering. Simon Bolivar University, dubbed Venezuela's University of the Future, was government founded, funded since it opened in the 70s. Now, alumni living abroad finance a university with private donation and teach classes via Skype. Professors can only expect to earn the equivalent of $25 per month, prompting many to flee the country. Over 430 faculty and staff members left the university between 2015 and 2017. So people are leaving leaving their job, the, the, the schools are closed, even though they're, they're, they might be free, people, they, there's not enough money to pay people who work there. And so there's no education available. Exactly. And um, again, the government took it over and put their cronies at the top instead of letting it be run by the people who knew what they were doing. So it also has suffered in the ones that are open has also suffered in management and and they're teaching more, I hate to say it, socialist policy, not as much economic <laughs> education and policy. So that- Or science, right? Or, exactly. Yeah. I, I have cousins who have fled Venezuela and are studying abroad and, of course, probably will never return. But the whole family has to- So every single time, and we haven't really mentioned this, but every single time a member of the family- Get, escapes and leaves Venezuela and doesn't come back, the government we will refuse to give a visa to the rest of the family members. So this is a way of trying to control the population and keep them locked in. So when you leave, you are causing the rest of your family to stay behind. And it's heartbreaking. The, you're breaking up families that need each other, um, but the government punishes, you know, you for, for leaving and escaping, even though it's their own policies that cause you to have to go elsewhere because there is no future. So, yeah, I, I didn't know if anyone had told you that. Yeah, no, I, I didn't uh, fully realize that. So healthcare, do you want to read this section about it? Healthcare is another challenge, and you touched on that with, with your own family members who stop being doctors. So yeah. Education is not the only sector experiencing brain drain. Over 13,000 doctors have fled Venezuela's inhospitable conditions since 2014. Medical professionals have been attacked by patients' relatives, frustrated by the shortage of supplies, failure of thousands of machines, rupture of sewage pipes, 
resignations of health personnel, power outages, and water shortages. Across the country, hospitals face shortages of basic medicines, such as those to control hypertension or diabetes, and high-cost medicines for cancer, Parkinson's, and multiple sclerosis are no longer imported. Treatments such as organ donations and transplants stopped in 2017. The 1996 Constitution guaranteed the right to health as an obligation of the state, but the state has instead reduced funding, silenced practitioners, and censored health system publications. The government spends about 1.5% of GDP on health care, which is 75% lower than the world standard. In 2015, Venezuela's health ministry stopped publishing weekly updates on relevant health indicators. When Health Minister Antonieta Caporella briefly resumed updates in 2017, she was immediately fired. The statistics revealed that between 2016 and 2017, mater maternal mortality rose 65% and infant mortality rose 30%. Tuberculosis, diphtheria, measles, and malaria are also creating emergency situations, and disease is accompanied by widespread malnutrition. According to WHO standards, malnutrition among children under the age of five in Venezuela has reached crisis level. A university study found that on average, almost two-thirds of Venezuelans surveyed lost about 25 pounds in 2017. Venezuelans are calling this the Maduro diet diet, as noted in a poignant letter. You can see if you click on the link. Uh, I, I, there's, there's just not enough that can be said about how terrible the situations are down there. As soon as a shipment of medical supplies gets sent in, um, they have to go under lock and key because the very nurses who are underpaid and hospital staff that are underpaid will take whatever they can to sell on the black market. So when my family needs medical um, care, they need to go to the hospital with their own IV supplies, their own medicines, their own syringes, which they pretty much have to go to the black market for. So the family gathers together whatever money they can, and, and they go to the market, buy whatever they can, and will... Um, try to take what they need to the hospital with them because they don't expect the hospital to actually have it. Um, it's really just terrible. And of course, Ch uh, Chavez and now Maduro, because suspicious of the United States uh, organizations like the Red Cross, he has refused their help. He has literally turned away shipments from them because he doesn't trust them and he says they're trying to um, undermine his regime and, and just crazy things like that. He has also, Venezuela has also refused help from neighboring countries too, that it finds suspicious. Only from those led by other communist regimes who would accept some help from. And most of the doctors currently serving in Venezuela are from Cuba. So like we mentioned before, there's been a lot of immigration from Cuba. Yeah, and, and those doctors I've read also, there's there's a whole story about these doctors being kind of forced labor into into different in Venezuela and Brazil uh, that are sent from uh, from Cuba. So uh, it, it's just it's just a heartbreaking every every single piece, and especially knowing that 20 years ago, just 20 years ago, um, it was perhaps not perfect, but at least there were there were professionals working hospitals were available, clinics were available, it, it was functioning. Um, Venezuela used to be the premier place in South America for healthcare. People from other countries would come to Venezuela to train there because they had great universities, great education standards and everything they needed. It was very, and yes, it was not affordable to all. I'm not saying it was perfect. It, it definitely was, um, was a more private-led system, and, and if you didn't have enough money, you didn't get access to everything, but you also didn't see the widespread suffering that is happening now. So the refugee crisis. Um, Venezuela is now the origin of one of the largest mass migrations ever on the Latin American continent. Over 4 million people have fled the shortages of food, water, medicine, and the UN says 1 million have left since November 2018. 
Former doctors and engineers work as waiters or store clerks in Colombia and Peru to send remittance back to family members who remain in Venezuela, but they frequently face hostility from citizens of other nations who accuse Venezuelans of stealing their jobs. Colombia, Venezuelan's neighbor to the West, is absorbing most of the fleeing. As of August 19, it is home to almost 1.5 million Venezuelans. Hundreds of thousands more pass through Colombia on their way to other countries, including Peru, Chile, Ecuador. Venezuelans now need a passport or visa to travel to other Latin American countries, when they previously only needed national identity card. This adds insult to injury as passports are difficult to obtain given paper shortages and dysfunctional um, bureaucracy. And there's a great video here about actually how Colombia has really opened its border to, to its neighbor and welcome people and even people opening their homes to, to Venezuelan. Um, so when you have to flee your country uh, in order to just live and feed your family, it's unbelievable. So the next section, the other challenge is infrastructure. So Patricia, I'll let you talk about that. In outages are regular occurrence, but a massive outage that affected 22 Venezuela's 23 states in early March revealed the severity of the state of Venezuela's energy infrastructure. Pro-government officials blamed Venezuela's opposition party, claiming they had sabotaged Venezuela's hydroelectric Guri Dam as part of an electrical war directed by the U.S. Energy experts, power sector contractors, and employees from the government energy company attributed the problems to years of underinvestment, corruption, and brain drain. Skilled operators had long left the company because of meager wages and an atmosphere of paranoia. The fallout has only exacerbated the suffering of the Venezuelan people. Looters started ransacking businesses for food and supplies. Gas stations could not pump fuel, causing many to turn to the black market for gasoline in a country that subsidizes fuel to the point that it is nearly free. According to Julio Castro of the organization Doctors for Health, at least 20 people died in public hospitals due to the outages, damaged or drained back gender drained backup generators could not keep machines required for dialysis, incubators, and artificial ventilation running. There's photos from The Guardian to illustrate the effect of the blackout in Caracas, and these blackouts continue today. My family, every single time that the electricity is working, they are filling every receptacle they can with water, filling the bathtubs with water, because they never know how long it's going to last. And so when the power goes out, they at least have water. And uh, that, that's the way they live daily. And there are times we don't get to hear from them for several days and we're worried. And it's because they had no electricity, so they could not power their, you know, computers or phones. So, yes. Yeah. In, in a country that is so energy rich, that's what's unbelievable about, about the story of Venezuela. So aid, and I think this paragraph really touches what you talked about. During the first week of February 2019, international aid reached the Colombian and Brazilian borders. President Maduro ordered troops to barricade bridges at the border to prevent aid from entering. Over 300 low-ranking soldiers fled their post that weekend, but they are, they are a small fraction of the 200,000 troops that remain loyal to Maduro and refused to let the trucks filled with food and medicine cross the border. Um, there's a New York Times Post podcast on the humanitarian aid debacle in February of 2019. Maduro repeatedly denied the extent of the crisis in Venezuela and said any efforts from the U.S. or other countries were part of a hostile foreign military intervention. At the end of 2019, however, Maduro reached an agreement with the Red Cross to deliver aid, and the first shipment reached Venezuela mid-April. And as of September 19, this aid has only to has led only to small improvements and shortages in medicine that still persist. So aid is blocked. Maduro just wants to control the population and really doesn't have in mind just the well-being of people. And it's it's so what what makes people do that? And this hunger for power. Um, it's just an incredible where it could lead to so much suffering. That is not necessary. That's not the, 
I know, totally. I mean, this was created. This was created. And I was going to say, the little bit of aid that comes through is almost imp impossible to guarantee. It's getting to where it needs to go. Because like I said, every step of the way, you have postal workers who will take it to sell on the black market. You have nurses, you have staff. You have, People are so desperate. It's just become such a survival of the fittest type of situation. And it's, it's terrible terrible in a country that 20 years ago had almost no incidence of crime. If you go back and look at crime records, Venezuela had zero murders. Venezuela had some pitpocketing, but very little larceny, very little burglary. It was a very Catholic country, very socially conscious. Um, it's, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Now there is just, just yeah. Chaos, complete chaos. chaos. So the international uh, entanglement um, over, do you, do you want to read that section? Sure, sure. Um, over 50 countries support Guado, but Mexico, Turkey, Iran, Bolivia, Nicaragua, China, and Russia continue to recognize the Maduro regime. China in particular has offered technical assistance to help restore the country's electrical grid. Additionally, China and Russia vetoed a United Nations Security Council vote in February to condemn the May 2018 elections and call for international humanitarian aid for Venezuela. Russia and Venezuela have a long history in the oil industry. Since 2015, Rosneft, the Russian state-controlled oil firm, has increased its loans to Venezuela and its shareholder stakes in a joint venture with PDVSA. A router's investigation uncovered documents revealing that equipment is scarce. Oil output is far lower than projected, and there is a 700 million hole in the balance sheet of the joint venture. Still, Venezuela buys Russian air weapons, which gives Russia an incentive to stand by its ally and even provide military support. However, Russian banks, grain exporters, and even weapon manufacturers have all curtailed business with Venezuela. Cuba is also heavily involved with Venezuela's oil industry. In the early 2000s, Cuban leader Fidel Castro signed a deal with Hugo Chavez to provide Cuba with crude oil in exchange for Cuban professional staff and intelligence and security agents to go to Venezuela. Venezuela's oil production has collapsed, and Cuba gets far less oil than the agreement states, but Cuba's reliance on Venezuelan oil and the country's longstanding allegiances to one another are incentives to support the Maduro regime. The opposition has criticized this long-standing agreement. And if I may add, if it wasn't for those Cuban so-called security officers, I doubt very much the Maduro would be still in power. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, of course. And sadly, that doesn't get covered enough, right? This, no, we, we it don't, does we're not. not hearing it, it, it really does not. And I'm not sure why, but it really does not. Uh, the role of, of Cuba in, uh, in keeping Maduro in, in power. Um, CITCO, there's also tensions as surrounded CITCO, a wholly owned subsidiary of Venezuela PDVSA, operating in the U.S. CITCO manages three refineries in the U.S. and amounts to about 4% of U.S. fuel. The CITCO business relationship has been strained, especially after Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin imposed sanctions on Venezuela's PDVSA, so that any new profits would be deposited in an account under Guiado authority, uh, authority, although the administration has yet to figure out how to disperse these funds to Guiados. In recent months, this has become a serious problem for Guiado, whose National Assembly would need uh, to make a $913 million payment to PDVSA bondholders this year to maintain control of CITCO. I don't know if you have some comments about that, but. Um, I, I don't really, I will tell you that there are many, many of my fellow Americans who refuse to, to support CITCO because yeah. they're, they're not wanting to support the Maduro regime. So knowing that, I mean, if it truly is going to the opposition, they might change their mind, but I, I haven't heard very much about this. Yeah. So the future of Venezuela. So we have the opposition uprising. Um, 
Despite the international community's condemnation of the election, Maduro began his next six-year term with an inauguration ceremony in January 2019. Barely two weeks later, mass demonstration broke out in Caracas in support of Juan Guaido, head of National Assembly. Given the contested election result, Guaido claims Maduro is usurping the presidency by staying in office and that Guaido can assume power based on Article 233 of the Venezuelan Constitution, which states, if at the outset of a new term there is no elected head of state, power is vested in the president of the National Assembly until free and transparent election take place. He swore himself in as interim president on January 23, 2019. The opposition gained momentum after rallying behind Guiado, but in reality has no control over any relevant government institution, government programs, or the armed forces. Maybe you can make a comment here about the National Assembly. What I found interesting about the brief is how it points to article in the Constitution that should have been backstops to what is happening right now, but are completely ignored or modified. Maybe you have you can take some make some comment about the National Assembly. Yes, absolutely. So again, one of the first things that Chavez did is call for a new constitution. So he had a constitutional assembly throughout the Venezuelan constitution that had governed it for over 150 years, that was modeled after the US Constitution and created this new constitution. And just like Chavez, very verbose and very long. Um, but it was all meaningless because Chavez and now Maduro believe that their policies and their laws that they decide, you know, force through really have more power than the actual constitution. And since they completely control the Supreme Court, there is very little checks and balance. Um, and the National Assembly, so Finally, there was enough of a momentum of courageous Venezuelans who turned on the regime and want something different so that um, the op it went to the opposition. And of course, because we're talking about dictatorial regime, it refused to accept that election and those election results. And, um, you know, the, the problem is with all of these institutions, including the ones we have here in the United States, the enforcement and the respect of it comes from, you know, you, enf you enforcing what it says. If you don't, if you ignore it, it's meaningless as a piece of paper. And, um, and of course, um, after this many years, um, the regime has complete and total control of the courts, the military, the police, um, there is no nobody who is on the side of um, the people, the, the people, the people. Yeah. So um, pressure from abroad. Do you want to read that section? It's kind of our last uh, section. And then we'll discuss like what people can do. So pressure from abroad. Do you want to continue on that? Yes. Um, on January 23rd, 2019, the U.S. recognized Guaido as leader of Venezuela which prompted a series of U.S. sanctions against the Maduro regime. In August 2019, these sanctions turned into a total economic embargo. Most of Europe called for re-elections by the end of January, and Spain, Britain, France, and Germany endorsed Guaido after Maduro refused to hold elections again. At the end of January, European Union lawmakers v voted 439 in favor to 104 against with 88 abstentions to recognize Guaido until new, free, transparent, and credible presidential elections take place. The EU parliament has no foreign policy powers, but does have symbolic importance, especially in the realm of human rights. Maduro responded in kind, severing diplomatic relations with the U.S., in early March 2019, the Maduro administration accused German Ambassador Daniel Kriner and the German government of repeated acts of interference in the country's internal affairs. The German government is one of the many that supports the opposition. 
Greener was among a group of diplomats from 11 Latin American and European nations that greeted Guaido when he returned to Venezuela from a trip abroad, but was the only one targeted. For more on the tense relationship between the U.S. and Venezuela and how it's affecting conditions right now, there is a BBC video. Violence and political stalemate continues between the two presidents. One spuriously elected but backed by the armed forces, the other self-proclaimed but endorsed by much of the Western world. Peace talks over the summer of 2019 between the two sides did little in the way of reaching a compromise. In fact, in January 2020, Guaido was expected to win re-election as head of the National Assembly until security forces loyal to President Maduro blocked Guaido and other Venezuelan opposition lawmakers from entering the National Assembly building on the day of the vote. Two days later, on January 7, the opposition, totaling 100 of the 167-seat Congress, forced their way in the building and swore Guaido into office. The international community condemned the move by the Maduro regime and continued to recognize Guaido instead of Luis Parra, who was named leader by pro-Maduro lawmakers. Experts at the Wilson Center have outlined the potential for a negotiated transition between the opposing parties, aimed at reversing the economic disaster, reestablishing democratic governance, and beginning national reconciliation and institutional repair. Other important steps include reestablishing the authority of national institutions, such as the National Assembly, and reforming the electoral system. International actors, including the U.S., however, should take care not to be too involved as they may unleash counterproductive responses and unintended consequences. Meanwhile, Venezuela's crisis situation shows no signs of improving. As governments and factions compete for power, the people of Venezuela continue to suffer. So what is, you know, the, this is, uh, so we're kind of concluding the, the brief and the next section is about ways to get involved and, and what, what you can do. And one of the thing is, is to really understand, we have a brief, the policy circle has a brief on free enterprise and what it is. And we hope that this brief uh, gave you a, a really good understanding of the economic policies that over the last two decades that just caused um, the, the complete disruption and, and collapse of, of Venezuela. There's a number of conversation calls about Venezuela that's also available on the brief. And it, and it would be key to, it's a, another way is to keep track of bills in Congress that relate to Venezuela and follow um, the U.S. involvement in foreign policy um, initiatives or, around Venezuela. Uh, and ways to engage, you know, there's um, no decides policy in Venezuela and you can stay up to date with information from the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. Uh, you can organize also some community gathering about aid policy and what your tax dollar are going to support in foreign countries. And, and you can really engage um, in your community uh, and with your lawmakers about uh, what their thoughts and reactions are in Venezuela. And I think it's important to even share with uh, those of us who have young um, kids or, you know, youth and your family, the story of Venezuela, because it might feel really far away, but it's very close. And, and it's something that happened in, in the 20 year old's lifespan. So I don't know, Patricia, if you have other suggestions of ways that people can involve and, and what to look for and, and how to engage with your representative that you care about Venezuela. Well, first of all, I want to thank you so much, Sylvie, because this is an amazing resource that you have gathered just for people to understand. And um, I, I think all of these are great things and definitely will, uh, you know, I hope folks will take advantage, consider doing some of these things. I do believe it is very meaningful to talk to legislators and in an election year like now to bring up in forums, in debates, in any opportunity you have, ask those who are asking for your vote how they, what they know about Venezuela and how they will vote on any issue that comes up. Um, there is no question in my mind that um, Venezuela is a lesson to us in what not to do. 
which means that we absolutely should know what happened in Venezuela so we can be aware and protect our institutions here in the United States. And then second of all, you know, that Venezuela um, disaster, some people might be tempted to think, well, that doesn't involve me. I'm fine. But first of all, there are, um, Venezuela is within striking distance worried about Cuba and you remember the whole Bay of Pigs and you know how it's a security risk. Venezuela is just a little bit farther than Cuba but definitely within striking distance and it's part of the reason for why China and Russia are supporting this regime and are going to want to keep this regime which is antagonistical to the United States values and ideas is because it is a close threat it is a place where they can put their ships and their guns and hit the borders of the United States. So it is absolutely essential that we care, and not just for the humanitarian suffering, but also for our own security and future of the United States. And of course, I am biased. I am biased. I have family members suffering and starving down there. And Venezuela has um, always been, until Chavez took over, a country that educated its populace and has now, through all of the exploitation of, um, of all the citizens, has provided doctors and professionals and experts in all the fields and all the you know professional sciences, engineers, and. Um, and, you know, it, it is a, definitely a country that we know can succeed and can be a great asset to the world and uh, protection for Latin America and, and freedom. So we should, we should get involved and do what we can. It is, um, it is really the right thing to do. I just don't see a way out that is peaceful. And I think that's something um, that scares me and it scares my family in Venezuela I don't see the, the forces that are in control are not going to relinquish their power through any kind of a, you know, peaceful, uh, peaceful transition. Peaceful election and transition of power and reverse back to a constitution that gave power to the people, really. So, exactly. well, thank you so much for um, taking the time to read this brief and, and also add your personal experience um, to, to this document. And I, and that is my goal to really share it, uh, with, with everyone and, and also, you know, for you to share it. And I hope that this, um, this brief, uh, encourages you to actually share and discuss, uh, what happened in, in Venezuela and, and understand why and the root ca causes of, uh, a humanitarian disaster that was really unnecessary, unnecessary that could have been avoided. So. Thank you so much.